I certainly think there should be more of a grounding in business skills within the architecture curriculum. Business of Architecture UK, episode 28. Hello and welcome Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. Hello and welcome, Ryan Willard here from the Business of Architecture and this week I'm talking to Chris Williamson who is one of the co-founders of Western Williamson which are about a 100 person strong practice located down in Southwark on the Cut in Waterloo. They, um, you've probably walked through some of their buildings. They do an immense amount of cultural buildings and infrastructure projects. They've worked on loads of London's stations from Paddington to Victoria to extensions at Stratford. And Chris is an amazing guy to talk to. He's really committed to architects uh, understanding and mastering entrepreneurship and the business skills. And just to actually be with him for uh, you know, the afternoon and just hear him reflect on how he's grown his practice over the last 30 years was a real privilege. So sit back and enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I have the great privilege of sitting with Chris Williamson, who is one of the founding partners of Western Williamson, who are infrastructure specialists. You were founded in 1985? That's right. So you've been going for over 30 years. Um, and you're also the international vice president of the REBA. You've been an ambassador for business skills um, for architects, and you run your own website and blog, and also the author of Retro Pioneers. So it's really fantastic to have you on the show. And I know that we've got a lot of very similar sorts of um, you know, missions or alignments about the architectural industry and also how architects approach business. So my first question really is, are architects bad at business? Um, sadly, I sadly admit that they are. I think the client service questionnaire that the RIBA does each year um, sort of shows that, mm. that, that we get a very high approval rating for all of our design skills. I think British architects are widely admired um, and respected throughout the world. Uh, we're, the, we, we're trained in design. We have a fantastic pedigree of design from the Victorian era, people like Brunel and Paxton, yeah. which we're still building on. That give, gets us a lot of work throughout the world because people acknowledge that that's what the British are good at. But when it comes to business... I think it's it's the same with a lot of creative industries. It's it's something to do with the the different side of your brain, probably, mm. and but also to do with the training. So there's there's there should be more focus given at architecture school on the business side, but it's a difficult uh, circle to square because not everybody wants to be involved in that side of the business yeah. and architecture is a broad profession and you have to cater for everything but I, th I certainly think there should be more of a grounding in business skills within the architecture curriculum. What do you think would be the most important sort of entry level skills for students to be learning about? Um, well I think it's listening to your client, and that, that's a common criticism. So the, the architecture survey, we get a sort of 70 or 80% approval rating for design, but only a 40% approval rating for looking after people's money. Mm. And I think working to a budget is a fantastic discipline and we have to be seen to be doing that and we have to listen to the client be very clear what we're telling them you know listen to what their budget is and gear our design for that and I, personally i think that's part of the joy of the job mm. if somebody's got a limited budget it's it actually helps the design process in some ways and so it 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 go. It, I think we need 
there's a lot of business skills we need and I, I would like to see that incorporated into the architecture curriculum but also into the continual professional development, personal mm. development, CPD, and, and make it a lifelong learning skill so that we can demonstrate to our clients that in order to remain as a chartered architect, as, as a member of the RIBA, you're actually better than somebody that isn't, somebody that's just an ARB member. Mm. And I think then we can really demonstrate to our clients that RIBA is, isn't just a membership club, it's a qualification. And if we can do that, we can sell RIBA uh, accreditation throughout the world and make it a really viable, tangible, uh, accredited qualification. Mm, that's quite interesting. How would, you, how would you suggest that the RIBA kind of monitor that or accredit business skills or...? Well, I, th I think... Personally, I would I would like to see the RIBA, um, and I've said this, and I, I'm, I'm still working on it and trying to get all the various departments at the RIBA to to uh, to go along with it. Is that we design our own CPD courses, and there there are modules, then they can be done online, um, and they you can have you have to you have to maintain that high standard so there might be a lot of criticism because you know you're actually asking more people to join and and, and asking for people to join internationally inviting them to join so we could boost the membership enormously mm. because a, a architect working in shanghai as a Chinese architect, would be able to demonstrate by being passing the modules that he needs to join the RIBA, he would be able, able to demonstrate to his client that he's better than the guy down the corridor that isn't an RIBA member. Yeah. So as, as well as joining the Singapore Institute of Architects or the Korean Institute of Architects, if you, if you, you would want to join the RIBA because you, you're able to demonstrate that you're more highly skilled than somebody else because you've passed their modules. Mm. So I think people are very willing, both in this country and throughout the world, to demonstrate that they and invest in themselves. So people are doing MBA courses yeah. and all sorts of things to show that they, they're highly qualified because, you know... It, I, I often use the analogy, would you go to a brain surgeon that doesn't keep abreast of new technology or new ideas? You wouldn't, you wouldn't go to somebody that wasn't highly, the highest skill. Mm. And I think that, that's another way in which the architects can charge more as well, which is a common complaint amongst architects that it's because it's a very competitive profession, it's quite yeah. poorly paid compared with other professions. So I think we have to raise our game. Mm. So we have to make it harder to become an architect, uh, make it easy for people to pass the modules or get information for those modules. Uh, and if we, if we really sort that out, and there's lots of publishing houses, there's lots of academic institutions that will help us do that. But it, and if we do it, I think we would get hundreds of thousands of new members throughout mm. the world uh, because I passionately believe in what the RIBA has to offer. Yeah. Um, I think it, it's a much maligned institute, but it is actually fantastic. And, yeah. and you know, the, 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 the 19, I can't remember when it was, 1936 or charter, when it was made a royal... Institute is for the advancement of the science and the art of architecture and the promotion of a, a civic society. Yeah. And I think by maintaining high standards and being able to demonstrate high standards, we want to make it the gold standard for architectural qualification. And I, I think we can achieve it. And I think it, we will. What do you think are the biggest obstacles facing you 
to doing that because it's quite a mindset shift really to to have architects really consciously engaging and celebrating business um, acumen and entrepreneurship um, it is in some respects and I, I, th I think I, I, I've always been one of my the things that sticks in my mind is when I was at university Norman Foster said that there's no reason why business and art don't go hand in hand and that he used the analogy of you know artists used to starve in garrets and you know they never made any money in their lifetime and probably Van Gogh is the prime example of that and they, they uh, and and Turner had a stack of paintings that never sold, and now they're worth millions. Mm. But and if if they and people like Warhol and Damien Hirst have really turned that on their head, and some of the artists that we work with professionally are much more commercially aware than a lot of architects are, and they guard their designs and guard their artwork really mm. carefully and, and you know only sell it at a premium yeah so I, I, th I think it's it's partly a, a mindset in, in architecture the way we're trained is to be very liberal to be very open-minded and to be you know open with our ideas and we love ideas and we, we we're you know we do competitions at the drop of a hat and give away all our best ideas and I don't think you can stop people doing that and that you know there's a move that we should we, you know that we shouldn't allow it but I think it's a you know it's a free society if you want to do that we do it all the time if we think we've got a good idea mm. for an art gallery in Basel or something and there's a competition then we do it because it's you know and even if they don't use it or end up using some of the ideas uh, you know that's just the way that it goes because it's good for our development so I wouldn't want to do anything that takes away the creativ creativity of architectural education and the high standard that we already achieve but I think just a bit more uh, just a, a taster for what good business sense is yeah and the the architects that I admire manage to combine business and art and I think there's a lot of architecture students a lot of architects as well that you know think it's uh, you know not not good practice to make money when in actual fact you know unless you're in business you can't practice architecture anyway yeah but there's there's obviously degrees, and you know there's some commercial firms that do great work, and some commercial firms that don't. But mm. by the same token, there's some more artistic, you know, one man bands that don't do great work either. So yeah. I think that you know it's a broad spectrum. It's not the fact that you know to be creative you have to be small. I think Foster and Renzo Piano and other practices show us that you can be creative and be a large business as well if the business is properly managed mm. and set up um, and you've got the right people yeah. and the right you can still have families make it a very family environment by having partners in charge of small groups it doesn't have to be one monolithic monolithic firm yes yeah, so, so there's lots of different ways of doing it yeah so the, the, the larger organizations become kind of more cellular in, yeah. their, in their structure yeah, yeah. Is that something that you practice here at Western? It is. We we well, we um, we have uh, ten partners, and each partner is in charge of ten people. So we're about a hundred people here. We've got an an office in Melbourne of fifty people, and an office in Sydney of about fifteen. And we try and create the same culture there. So we've got uh, we mentor e each. Person. I mean, I think we could grow that, that model that, so you can have 20 people working in under each partner and still making it, make it very much like a family mm. and know, know everybody and everybody works in the team. Um, so that, that, that's certainly the way that we like to work. 
And how did you, how did your company begin? What was the sort of genesis of that? And what's, what's been the sort of the key to successfully running a practice and also entering into very difficult uh, sectors like in infrastructure and where there's, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of very fiercely guarded and, you know, you're kind of the framework agreements and all these types of things. Yeah, yeah no, it is, it, it's an interesting question because I don't know, it, 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 we, we celebrated our 30th anniversary a few years ago and, and as part of that, you start to look back on how you've got there and and we do a lot of uh, a lot of work with local school kids where we invite them in show them what we do and it's one of the questions that you always get you're like, how did you do this and you can't you, we always say i always say well quite slowly first of all because mm. andrew and i met at university and we only really started working together because one of the tutors put us together in an alphabetical order. He said, uh, Williamson, you can work with Weston um, on these group projects. And we started working together. We found that we had different skills, but compatible skills, but we liked the same thing. So we kept on working together after we left university. We won a, a couple of competitions. Uh, some of which didn't go anywhere and some did. Um, I, I, w I went to work for Michael Hopkins, who'd been a partner at Norman Foster, and Andrew went to work for Richard Rogers, but we both lived in Belsize Park, and in the evening evenings we kept doing competitions together and, again, had some success, some that went, you know, went somewhere and some that didn't. But then... <clears throat> About, after about five years of, of working, we were, there, was a, there was an open call for uh, an exhibition called 40 Under 40 at the RIBA, and this was in 1985. Mm. And we put all of our competition work and some of our college work together and put it on a panel, and we, we were selected. Um, and so 30 years later... Were the only practice. There's our allies and Morrison, are the, are the only other practice that are still together, uh, which is a fantastic achievement. Yeah. And it, so you and the, it hasn't been all plain sailing by any means. There's been times when you know things haven't been great, and you know we've but we've stuck at it and we've stuck together, and it's a fantastic achievement. I think uh, to have been in business with Andrew mm. for so long. It's been, it's been great. Well, so, but, but I think we... Um, so we, we put all our work together for this exhibition and Michael Manser was the RIBA president then. And he really encouraged us to, to start a business. And his wife w was instrumental in just... You, you, you meet various people in your career... Mm that are just, uh, encourage you, you know, and that, that ha happens at school, happens at university, and it happened, uh, you know, when we put our work together. And, you know, we didn't know anything about um, how to start a business. So I did a, a, a part-time master's degree in project management um, at the South Bank, and it was one of the hardest things that I've ever done. Half of it was project management, half of it was property development. So I, I met some young property developers on the course, and mm. we, we won some work from them, and uh, some really interesting projects. Um, and at the time, all we were trying to do was to match our existing salaries. So we, we weren't earning an awful lot at that time, and it was relatively easy to match our salaries. And then you, you were in that situation where you've actually got too much work for two people, and, and you have to take somebody on and then take somebody else on. So it's a very, very gradual yeah. thing. But we, we won quite early on, we won a competition to design an, a, a big office building for Tilbury Docks. And that, we did all the working drawings for it. 
um, and we were really pleased with the design. And but then the, the 1988, the property market crashed, and they decided not to proceed with it. We'd got the planning permission, we'd done all the work in drawings, we'd actually been paid for a lot of the work. So we'd, we were sitting around wondering what, what do we do now? Because you know, we, we thought that was going to be the next sort of three years worth of work. Mm. And then we were interviewed by the Jubilee Line, uh, an architect called Roland Paoletti that had come over from Hong Kong to head up the Jubilee Line, came and interviewed us. And he put us on a short list for London Bridge Station. And because I'd done this project management degree, I was able to do all the questionnaires, all the health and safety stuff that they were asking. Mm. Uh, whereas a lot of the other young architects that he wanted to work on the project weren't able to do, I think. So that put us in a really good position and we won that. But I think it just showed, in a way, it's the randomness of where your career goes. Yeah. You know, I, 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 we if we'd have done the Tilbury project, we would have probably became uh, commercial office uh, architects. We didn't, and we ended up drifting into the transport sector. Mm. And it's been, it's been really good, and we've really enjoyed it, and we'd like, we really enjoy those city shaping projects. And, you know, from starting off on the Jubilee line, which was, primarily just seen as a transport project. Uh, we've got involved in projects similar to that, but they're now seen as regeneration projects and city shaping projects. So we're now involved in how the project, uh, how the city changes mm. and giving people a choice of where to live and work, which the, the Jubilee Line you know, it was the developers that made all the money yeah. on the back of the infrastructure. But now the government have got wise to that and they're making sure that with different levies, that Crossrail, for example, was a third funded by private finance. And, and Crossrail 2, when it gets approved, will be at least 50% uh, funded by private developers, which is great. Mm. Because, you know, they're the ones that benefit um, house prices go up, rents go up, yeah. um, and it shouldn't just be the government that funds, that has all the cost of the infrastructure. And what, it, what, what have you found some of the biggest obstacles then that you've been able to surmount whilst growing your practice and going in, into the, the direction of infrastructure? And have you ever wanted, or I know that you've, you've kind of done other designs for other types of buildings, how do you navigate yourself into other sectors um, it's, it, it is quite difficult in, in England, and a lot of architects always say this, that, you know, we, we've got a lot of, 40% of our office are from other parts of the EU, and, right. and the Italians, for example, you know, find it quite weird how English architects get typecast often for different kinds of buildings. Whereas if you can design in Italy, you'll, you'll get asked to do lots of different things. But for us, we do genuinely enjoy it. We, we like the discipline of working. You have to work in a very collaborative team with civil engineers and engineers with different stakeholders. And we've developed quite a, a good skill set of, mm. of being able to do that. Um, it's something that you don't necessarily have to do if you're working for certainly a private client or a commercial developer. There are much less, much fewer stakeholders yes. um, and people to keep happy. But on a, a large infrastructure project, part of the skill it's is, is it, yeah, sort of fast is companies, it, isn't yeah. it? Is it? It's getting it over the line. Mm. So again. Going back to the business model, you've not only got to be able to design, you've got to be able to deliver the project as well and navigate it through all of those various hurdles. But you, you do have to be very self-motivated as well because we've got people working on projects like 
Paddington at Crossrail that have been working on it for sort of 10 or 12 years. So our project architect, Raffaella, has been away, had a baby, come back, and so she's still the project architect. And, you know, she, when it finishes... But, it, you know, she's come back a lot uh, calmer, a sort of a lot... You know, if you can deal with a family, you can deal with clients. So I think... There's lots of uh, the, 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 you ha- you have to have lots of different skills to mm. deliver a project. Um, not just the design takes sort of ten or twenty percent of the time, and eighty percent of it you're battling to to retain control of the design and making sure it's delivered properly. And what kind of sort of specific communication processes when you're dealing with? large organizations like TfL and Crossrail where, where you, as you say there's so many different stakeholders they're kind of public companies and how do you as architects um, kind of not allow the decision making just to get totally spread out and overly bureaucratic how do you control that um, kind of- it, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of discipline as well and, and knowing when to involve people I mean I think if you, if you involve people too late, they react against it and think it's a fait accompli and will vote against it. So if you involve them from the start and take them with on the journey, um, so and because a station like Paddington, for example, which is a Grade Two listed building, uh, fantastic heritage structure, and you're putting something modern. Uh, next to it and the the whole setting is listed Mm. Uh, you've obviously got to work with people and and take them with you Um, so it's a matter of knowing what to present when and making sure that you everybody is aligned Uh, but we've got we've developed some really good systems of how to do that so sometimes we get everybody together and we've developed a system that we pin up all the options and go just go through them and sometimes that works and sometimes we have to do it we we we, we deal with people separately if if there are particular issues like heritage or uh capacity or um other types of stakeholders mm. but it it is it, it is a, a process to and you have to be open and not honest as well. I think making and, and taking people with you, I think, is what we do best. And what, what kind of advice would you give to, say, smaller practices that were wanting to enter into something as complex as infrastructure projects? It almost seems like one of those kinds of sectors that would be nearly impossible to... Um, to, to sort of deliver anything in unless you've already got uh, you know some serious track experience yeah it can, it can be but it shouldn't be because I mean when I think the con- conversely if you if you work with uh, you know a large engineer and work under their wing mm. then that that's an easy way of, of getting into the process. So we, we, we mentored a firm about five years ago for exactly that reason. They wanted to get into the infrastructure market. In fact, they just won a job against it. <laughs> um, so it, do, it does work. Testament, you can, to, you testament can, to your mentorship. <laughs> yeah, you can do it. Um, and I think, so, I think people don't... If you if you have a if you have a collaborative attitude, mm-hmm. I think a lot of architects probably don't, and they want to do it all themselves. But if you collaborate with people, uh, either at home or abroad, I mean, going back to working internationally, there's no reason why small firms can't work internationally, particularly with modern communication techniques and modern ma- ways of working. If you collaborate with the right people. In, in each country mm. there's lots of architects in Singapore say that want to break into say the hospitality market so if you've got those skills of hotel or restaurant design and work with the right people so that that's another thing I'm trying to do at the RIBA is 
create a database of like-minded companies that want to work collaboratively. And I think if you want to work in that way, then there are lots of opportunities. Mm. And what's next? What's next for Western Williamson? Because I know you've, you've saying you've just um, opened up some international offices. What, how, has, yeah. how has that been as a, as a process? And again, what were the obstacles that you found in, in, uh, in working overseas? Um, it w- wasn't... We, so we, we got invited to work in Australia in particular uh, by the engineers that we've been working with here over the last 30 years. So they were people like Mott McDonald and Arabs and Acom and Arcadis were coming to us and saying, you know, there's these projects that we'd like to pitch for. Um, and uh, both Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane are doing quite similar projects all at the same time. So having done non, no sort of infrastructure projects over the last 20 years, they've all decided to build the equivalent of Crossrail um, in those cities all right. at the same time. So there's a capacity issue, a skills shortage. So that's why we were invited to go. Uh, we won the Melbourne project and we've won part of the Sydney project and we're just finishing the the uh, tender at the moment for the Brisbane project. Um, but it, for us, for me, I'm 60. It's a, it's a new lease of life for me for the next 20 years to grow a new business. So it's it's fantastic. Um, I'm really enjoying it. It's. Um, it's, there's lots of challenges as well because you you know you've got a brand and a culture here mm. that you're trying to export thirteen thousand miles away. So, but we've been very lucky so far. In half the office in Melbourne have gone out from here. Right. So you've actually been exporting. Yeah. 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 And half of them are recruited locally, and they've been fantastic. We've got some really good local people. The people we've got in Australia don't want to come back it's a great place to work so part of our challenge is over the next three or four years is to win more work so that we can keep them there and actually build an office there yeah so we don't just want to go and do a project and then come back again Uh, we've done that before in places like India and Kuala Lumpur which are great places to work but sometimes the build quality and the design expectations aren't what we want to do. Mm. So we're we're concentrating on places where they want our expertise and our design skills and the way we run the business. Um, So places like North America and Australia are probably very few places that we would want to go and work. And also... We're conscious that you can't spread yourself too thin. Yeah, you have to be realistic uh, about where the best opportunities are. I've got here in my notes as well, actually, that you were that you used to run uh, breakfast business seminars. We did, yeah. I mean, I the the business side of architecture is something I've always been interested in, and I read a lot of books about business and as much as I do design and I think um, I mean I, I, I find it fascinating I, you know I, I do like the business side of whether it's football or any sport you know I like what happens on the pitch but I li- the older you get the more you realize that it's actually it's not the people on the pitch they matter a lot uh, the manager matters, but it's the owners mm. and the, how the, how the club is run that gives continued success. And I think that's the thing that I find the most interesting is that continued success. And all of my heroes are not people that can write one great pop song. It's you know having a lifetime of, of writing fantastic songs or performing and. 
um, and f- films as well. You know, that I like that the idea of longevity. Yeah, that people can and reinvention. Yeah, yeah, and because uh, the world is changing rapidly, and you know, I'm particularly excited over how people are going to travel between and around cities over the next 20 years uh, it's going to be unrecognizable nobody quite knows whether hyperloop is going to work and whether mm. how quickly automated vehicles and how many of them they're going to be and what the ownership of them is going to be and but uh, we know that it's going to happen but just as when I, I used to be fascinated by tomorrow's world when I was a teenager <laughs> it happened we know it's going to happen we just don't know when that tipping point is mm. going to be and it'll be fascinating to well if I live long enough to see it what what how that what those effects are going to be but that when we're designing cities that's what we need to think about mm. and it's, it's very interesting because it all interlocks into what what you've been talking about of having kind of globalized organizations and you know for example what we do at the um, architects marketing institute and business of architecture there's people dotted around the world um, and you're having these company structures that are actually um, you know you've got people working in india you've got people working and yeah. the, the digital communications and that yeah. and that combined with increased uh you know ease of transport yeah is is opens up a very interesting set of possibilities for how businesses can actually start to structure themselves yeah definitely and, definitely i mean we 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 used to do a, a lot of work in in uh, china uh, 10 years ago when china was going through that huge expansion of high speed rail so we we were we would work alongside the railway design institutes, which are basically the state railway designers. Uh, so we, we had relationships with the railway design institute in Xing, in, in Chengdu, and in Shanghai, and worked with them on several projects. And yeah, it was fantastic that we could be designing, sending work there. They would do all the animations, do all the fly-throughs, do all the visuals. And when I used to go there, I used to, they sort of bleed you dry. They make you do sort of three years worth of work in three months. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's really fast pace. And they've got lots of people uh waiting on you to say you know what color do you want this what what's what kiosk, what does this kiosk look like and mm. it's fantastic and it but it, and it i think there's lots of people now so we 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 have 24 hour working really we can work here and in sydney mm. uh so people are working in sydney while we're sleeping and then you come back in the morning and you know you've got another uh design to look at um, it's you can be working all, all the time, um, yeah, and it's it is fantastic. And just to sort of wrap up, what what key bits of advice would you give to young small practices on on having on sustaining that kind of longevity in a career? Um, I think, I think you, well, you've got to enjoy it and you've got to not, I I think, you know, I look back on, you know, some of the more difficult times when I tried to get my son, uh, to be an architect (laughs) because I think it's, I personally, I think it's a fantastic job. I love it. And I can't think of anything I'd rather do. I, 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 my favorite subjects at school were physics and art and, uh, the art side I got a place to do graphic design and then decided actually I'd like to find out more about architecture and it's the best thing I ever did because as a graphic designer I would probably have liked the immediacy of it you Mm. know designing a record sleeve or a a book cover and I think I still like graphic design a lot but and it, it sometimes it gets a bit painful when you've designed something and you have to wait five six years to see it finished so I think you but it, life's like that and you have to stick at it you, you I think these days there's too much immediacy mm. uh, and you have to be 
have a self-belief and stick around. Um, and you know, that's one of the great things about Andrew and I. We, we've just decided, you know, we just stuck at it. And, and, and uh, all the other people in the 40 under 40 exhibition, uh, some of them are still having fantastic careers and gone on to be great. But they've all fallen out with their partners. Yes, and uh, it really helps to have somebody to bounce ideas off and to you know. Uh, and, and and what do you think is the one of the keys to having a successful partnership, business relationship? I think we try and you respect each other's opinion because I mean I think. We've, you know, as well as running a business, uh, we've also designed and built our own offices, uh, both here in this building, which is a converted uh, warehouse, and, and before that, a photographer's studio. But before that, we bought a plot of land on the corner of Tower Bridge Road and Tanner Street. I mean, it was only 10 by 12 metres, but we d designed a four-storey glass building. Um, and that was fantastic. And that, that you know, we, we, that was because we got fed up with paying rent to a, an absentee landlord who was an architect. In, and every time I phoned him up, because the roof started leaking, I could hear the waves lapping on the shore of a beach <laughs> in Antigua. And I just thought, this is crazy. We're paying, you know, 15,000 a year. And if we've been doing this for 10 years mm. now, if we do it for another 30 years, we could build somewhere. Yeah. So I think, and, and Andrew has, you know, got the same we've we've agreed on you know we, then they're big things to agree on as well you know so we, and we, but we generally have talked it over and decided that that that's that, that's the way to do it but i think finding a good business partner i mean there's the architecture profession in particular is littered with people that haven't been able and i suppose there's nothing wrong with that because people do drift apart and mm. grow, grow up differently and have different aims the same as a marriage you know you, you you do have both from a design point of view and from a from a financial point of view probably have different lots of different uh stresses uh but luckily uh we've managed to keep within reasonable boundaries and agree on most things. And was the, the, the building of your own offices, was that the only time you've kind of done your own projects where you've been the client? Or have is that, is that you, have you tried that as an alternative business model as well in the past of other things? Um, yeah, so just on those two offices, in fact, when, when, we, found, uh, when we found this place, I, I'd, I'd seen it a few weeks before and I, I said to Andrew you know you must come and see this place I think because the problem with the building we were at previously we were on five floors mm. and there were 15 people on each floor and it's very difficult to communicate so you, the, we wanted to find somewhere where we could all be together on one or two floors so if you see somebody, you can go and talk to them rather than make an appointment and fi or finding them on the phone when you've walked up three floors to see them. So from an from a office culture point of view, it's, that, that's what we wanted to do. So I, I'd found this building and Andrew agreed it was the right thing to do. And I said, you know, we should have done more of this. You know, we should have done more because it's always worked well. But I think... In the in the eighties, when we started, we had a few clients that, because of the recession at the end of the eighties, they sort of overstretched themselves, mm -hmm. and people were a lot of designers were moving into converted warehouses, and you know everything looked rosy, and some of them expanded into America or, or started setting up provincial offices. 
And I think that kind of, you always learn from those experiences, particularly in your formi formative years. Mm. So it's always st stuck in our minds that it, it can be fantastic, but it can go wrong pretty easily as well. So we've always been a bit more cautious probably than we should have been. Mm. But it's, it's, at least we're still here, <laughs> probably because of that. Yeah, and I suppose um, as well, it's, it's given you the ability to really focus on on one one particular thing as well. Yeah, and and it, it, I think you only you only do it when you want when you need to do it. Um, it's the same as moving house. I have lots of friends that are always moving house because they think they're making lots of money and. But actually, it's not, you know, I prefer to be a bit more settled, probably, mm. and not, uh, you know... I, 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 all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but, and I've enjoyed, you know, designing things for other people. Um, and it's, it's, it would have been nice to have, have, have had a different, you know different experiences of different offices probably but it's we're too too busy uh doing work than than looking at ways of making money or to you know keep moving offices yeah brilliant thank you so much for your time it's absolutely thank brilliant thank you very much thank you so that is a wrap thank you for listening the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.